why is it that we want doctors in particular and clinicians broadly, doctors and nurses, to take a much larger leadership role? Well, I think clinicians need to take a leadership role for a number of reasons, but probably the primary one has to do with, a, with what I call the modern view of excellence itself in, in enterprise. I mean, I, I think a, a modern organization, whether it's a for-profit company or a not-for-profit endeavor, even a governmental one, <clears throat> I think seeks excellence through the eyes of the person it serves. That's, that's the modern view, the, cons the, the, the consumerist view, which says I'm as good as the people I serve think I am and no better. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a distinct alternative to the kind of technocratic view of excellence in which you know, the profession gets to determine the nature of excellence. But that still requires deep, deep knowledge of the needs and the condition of the person you're serving. Well, who has that? Mm -hmm. The people serving do. That, that's, where, that's where the interface is. If we cut professionals out of the redesign process, we lose all the knowledge, tremendous amount of knowledge about what the nature of a proper helping interaction looks like. Pursuing change without the, uh, the leadership of clinicians is extremely hazardous. The other thing is science. I mean, it's important to do things properly according to facts, according to nature, the way nature works. And uh, yeah, I suppose uh, non-clinicians can study that and learn it, but that's what we're trained to do. We're, we're trained to understand what the fact base is and we'll make very naive decisions as a, as a health service uh, unless it's guided by, by distinct mastery of, of science. How do you mobilize large groups of, 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 of cold-faced level doctors and nurses and therapists to take a much greater role? I think in general my rules for better engagement of clinical leaders would be trust them. They, they trust their hearts. You know, I think that on the whole they want to do well. They want to serve patients. That's why they came into this, into, into this part of their lives. They want to relieve suffering. Um, so identify at that purpose level first. Uh, they, they need safety. They, 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 need a, they need a space in which they can learn and experiment. I think we need uh, data, information. I mean, it's very hard to work in the dark. And so properly provided with great respect, information on how we're doing as a collective and individually, I think would be helpful, motivating to potential physician leaders. And they'll need training. It's, it's, it's not, certainly not in our DNA. We don't learn it in childhood. We don't learn systems thinking and measurement and, and uh, improvement is not an important capability like walking. It has to be taught. But I think if we trust the clinician workforce and give them the tools and the information and the safety, to, psychological safety to, to pursue improvement, we'll, we'll see it. So you're arguing that you know, it's the leader's job to allow people to remain connected to why it was they wanted to be doctors and nurses in the first place, or encourage them to get reconnected to that primary kind of motivation. One of the jobs of leaders is to set a context at work that allow people to find meaning in their own work. Um, Paul O'Neill, the former Secretary of Treasury and ACOA chief executive, has said that a precondition to excellence, he calls it a precondition, is that the people who do work have to be able always to say three things about their work. One is that um, I am treated with dignity and respect by everyone I encounter. A second is I'm given the tools and the support to do work that adds meaning to my life. And the third is that somebody notices. Mm -hmm. And I can't think of three better rules. Flip it over and say if you are a leader that treats always with dignity and respect and expects that of the people around you, that are constantly surveillant for whether you're giving the workforce tools to add meaning to their lives, to do the work that adds meaning to their lives, and that you notice you're en route to success. And uh, that option's always available to leaders. One of the things that was so galling, I think, to a lot of professionals was the kind of the, fl the, the, the frank loss of compassion in, in, represented in the mid-staffs environment. If we are nothing, we must be compassionate. In, in, in all of our dealings with the people whom we serve. How do we think about preserving compassion as healthcare becomes progressively more technologic and technically uh, enabled and driven? At mid-staffs, <clears throat> there were behaviors and experiences the patients had that 
look for all the world like loss of compassion as if the caregiver no longer cared. But we need to go upstream from that. Why? What happened? Uh, I cannot believe that the average nurse or doctor or, or therapist at Midstaffs truly didn't care, truly lost caring. They simply disconnected from parts of their souls, parts of their spirit. Something made them do that. Something about the context made it impossible for them to remain whole. The culprits would have been probably leadership issues, uh, support systems that became impossible. If you want to drive a person insane, keep giving them a task that they cannot possibly carry out in the context. They must, in their own defense, disconnect from caring about the task. What else would they do? So I see the issue of compassion as a consequence, not a cause. Does technology push us that way? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I mean, the technologies are uh, a new, provide us with new ways to help people and new challenges to what compassion will mean. But of course, we can be compassionate in the most technically minded intensive care unit, just as we can in the psychiatrist's office. How do you think about scale in a world where we truly feel that it's local leadership and at the level of the Board of Governors of this institution at the level of the executive of this institution. How do we think about creating the conditions for scale in a world of distributed leadership? I, I think the very important problem of scaling good change now is maybe one of the hallmark problems of this next decade in trying to get healthcare change. Concepts, concept frames are somewhat central. For example, the idea that patients are better cared for when they're powerful, when they actually have voice and are involved. I think that's a general principle that I would mm -hmm. strongly endorse, almost as proven. The idea we should use science in practice, mm -hmm. general principle. Mm -hmm. So call these concepts, change concepts for better care. Those can be assembled and made available and articulated and, and I guess in some terms centralized. I don't mean that's not a power issue, that's a, just a knowledge issue. Um, and there's a duty of leaders to do that. Um, a second is will building, like, you know, it's comfortable to stay, more comfortable usually to stay put than to change. So um, someone's got to provide the, the uh, drive and say, you know, I, standing still is not really going to work. Let me explain how. And there are day-to-day -day tasks of support that can be centralized, helping with budgets, helping with training, helping with, with the uh, information technologies. But, you know, the, the actual details of changing care, what does it mean to involve patients here in this ward this time? How, how, how will I make sure care is reliable in this op operating theater this time? That's highly local. Mm -hmm. And if you get top-down management of details, you're about to make a mistake. Mm -hmm. So this combination of local implementation, adaptation, of problem solving, figuring things out, and, and will and ideas and support to execution from, from the center, that's the cocktail that I think or works best. You know, there's this tension in the UK between kind of uniformity and equity and local excellence. You know, in a distributed model of performance improvement and innovation, you're always going to end up with some geographic variation, yes. which may equalize over time, but in the short run. And so you run the risk of the of, of the kind of the postcode lottery argument that says, well, we, we're not comfortable with tolerating this level of variance. Do you have a sense of that problem? In the UK, it's, it's a deeply held value that there be equity around the countryside. Yeah. How, do you, how do you think about I mean, the idea of committing to excellence as a uniform promise in a system like the NHS is not just acceptable, it seems moral to me. So, so um, I, I understand a theory that says we're going to uh, create some form of equity. But you, you can't write the details down from the center. It isn't going to work. There's too much variation in local context, local needs. Uh, uh, you know, Mrs. Jones is elderly and lonely and she needs time to achieve comfort. And Mr. Smith is a busy uh, lawyer, and he does 10 minutes to get this done, and please get him in and out fast. Well, that's variation, but it's variation that's adaptive to the local 
needs and demands, and that's smart. Mm -hmm. There's no substitute for wisdom. Mm -hmm. and, and you've got to have, be wise enough to allow, to encourage this adaptation to local context, local histories, local, local priorities. And uh, a smart leader will do that.